Composer, performer, and inventor of the modern recital, in many ways Clara Schumann is one of the musical world's foremost feminist figures. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Clara Schumann. Clara was born in Clara Josephine Wieck in 1819. Her mother was always very kind to her, but she did not see much of her after the age of five, as her father had an affair and had divorced her mother in favor of his mistress. This was an era when divorces were very uncommon, and it was a big social stigma on her mother, and Clara went to stay with her father. The father knew a bit about music and pretty much planned out Clara's career for her. Because she had the aptitude for music, her father essentially forced her into becoming a musician. Soon, Robert Schumann began staying with the family, and although he was horrified by Friedrich's abuses, he admired Clara's playing quite a bit, and he discontinued his law studies in order to focus entirely on music. The story of Robert and Clara's romance can be seen in my video on Robert Schumann. While Friedrich was angrily causing a fuss about his daughter's love life, Clara was an incredibly popular pianist. She went on grueling tours around Europe, which gave her fame and her father money. In the spring of 1838, she performed in Vienna to enthusiastic crowds who couldn't get enough of her performances. In an era when many young girls were taught pianistic basics with the thought that musicality was attractive in a potential wife, Clara took the stage with as much bravado as her male counterparts. In fact, Frederick Chopin couldn't get enough of her playing, and actually compared her playing favorably to that of Franz Liszt, who was known to go on stage and break pianos. During the end of her time in Vienna, she was named Royal Imperial Chamber Virtuosa, the first time that esteemed honor had been given to a woman, a Protestant, a teenager, or someone who wasn't born and raised in Vienna. But Clara was not just a performer. In fact, she held her own in the compositional world, despite the fact that said compositional world was pretty patriarchal in nature. Her friend Felix Mendelssohn was one of the few composers who actually gave credence to the idea that female composers could be just as good as the men, and in fact he actually laughed in the face of an acquaintance who was surprised that one of Clara's chamber pieces was so good. Clara and Robert's early pieces contained similarities to each other, reminding them of their love, and although communication between the two was banned by Friedrich, he still let Clara perform many of Robert's pieces. Once Robert and Clara married, their lives were more intertwined than separate. Between them, they only had one piano in the house, and Clara often deferred its use to her husband because she thought that composition was the greater of their two arts. She raised their many kids and somehow was able to add to her repertoire despite not having much piano access and go on tour on top of all that. Robert was not a fan of this touring business. He preferred to stay at home and write his music and his music criticism, but he hated not seeing Clara and so joined her on a couple of her trips. During an especially grueling tour to Russia, he nearly died, and after that his mental health was never really the same, although it really wasn't all that strong to begin with. In May of 1849, the couple found themselves in Dresden. Now, Dresden was undergoing the spring uprisings where the citizenry and the government were completely at odds, there were riots, uh, there was terrorists everywhere, it was really just a bad scene. Amidst all this, they found themselves in the city, and they had four kids at the time. Number five was two months from being born, and Robert's mental health was really not in good shape. As revolutionaries and government forces struggled in the streets, men of fighting age were being called on by both sides to join their cause. In fact, Clara was responsible for keeping Robert hidden during all of this. She hid him and the kids in order to save their lives. She knew Robert was in no position to be fighting for anything. Remember, she is seven months pregnant at this point. She sneaks out under cover of darkness with Robert and their oldest child, leaving the other three kids with a couple of servants. And then she goes back into the city, evading troops and rioters left and right to retrieve the other three kids. Robert encouraged Clara's compositions, but since marrying, she had completed very few pieces. This is due to the fact she was busy with everything else she was already doing, and she thought of Robert as a genius in the art but also it was because of a cultural assumption that women, for some reason, couldn't be legitimate composers. Her self-criticism increased to the point where she all but completely stopped writing. She stressed out quite a bit about being the one to break the glass ceiling, and she really didn't think she had the chops to do it as well and legitimize her entire sex in the eyes of a patriarchal society. Together, the couple met a young Johannes Brahms. Schumann immediately proclaimed the news of the discovery of Brahms' talent to anyone who was reading his music criticism, and these were big shoes that Brahms honestly found hard to fill. Nevertheless, they maintained close contact with Brahms, and they were the nucleus of a bunch of musicians actively opposed to the Futurist School, 
of Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner. Clara had a lot to say about those two, and hardly any of it was good. Eventually, Robert's condition led him to hospitalization, and he died two years later. Among those who sought out arrangements for Robert's comfort during those last two years was Brahms, who actually investigated different mental hospitals in the area and came to the conclusion that the one he was at was the one that favored the most humane treatments. Clara, meanwhile, was forced to go back into a public spotlight that she had let wither. She arranged tours all over Europe and even considered coming to the United States. She settled for tours around the continent with occasional excursions to London, much like Haydn a century before, where she was incredibly popular. Throughout all of this, she was influential in dictating essentially what the modern recital program is. Although Franz Liszt can be credited with inventing the term recital and turning the piano sideways so that audiences could see hands flying up and down the keyboard, she was influential in establishing what was actually on the programs. When her career started, she was essentially playing the pop music of the era in salons, and by the end of her 60-year career, she had all but decided essentially what every pianist to this day still plays, starting off with a Baroque piece, including a Beethoven sonata sort of in the middle, and finishing up with a modern piece. Now, that doesn't seem so crazy today, but back then Baroque music was all but unknown. Beethoven was considered too much for modern audiences. And her contemporaries were the modernists at the time. People like Brahms and Schumann, known and loved today, were considered way too cutting edge for these audiences. But she knew when to introduce these pieces. And that was the key to her success. The fact that she pretty much single-handedly shaped this is an incredible feat unto itself. But what's possibly even more incredible is the fact that she memorized everything. In fact, her memorization was looked upon with disdain for the musical establishment as simply showing off. But nowadays, you'd be hard-pressed to find any musician, any solo pianist particularly, who doesn't perform from memory. Clara was plagued by health problems in the last years of her life, but continued to will herself to go out on stage and continue to play pieces that she believed in. She worked with Brahms in a collected edition of Robert's works, and together they tried to suppress pieces from Robert's late career that they felt were unrepresentative of his ideology and of his way of composition. Brahms had a deep connection with Clara and likely held a romantic interest in her, which she never reciprocated. Nevertheless, they did not let this get in the way of their friendship, and Brahms was a steady, encouraging presence and a good friend to her and her children until the last days of her life. In late life, Clara taught at the Hawk Conservatory. While there was a good deal of open hostility to having a feminine presence, on the faculty, her students absolutely loved her and continued to carry on the traditions and the things that she had instilled into them. Who knows how many of the adages of modern piano playing originate or were passed on or kept alive by what Clara did with her students. Shortly before her death, after her concertizing career had concluded, her children convinced her to write down short improvisatory preludes that she'd use as warm-ups. And while she was initially reluctant to do so, because they changed every time she would play them, she eventually relented and notated them. She eventually succumbed to a stroke, passing away in 1896 at the age of 76. As an icon of musical world, she transcended the boundaries of gender to become one of the great legends of piano playing. And she produced pieces of remarkable artistic worth while remaining convinced that they were nothing but trifles. Mm -hmm.